This is System Trader Show, episode number 15. Robert Carver, a professional approach to systematic trading and ex-hedge fund manager. Welcome to System Trader Podcast. Listen to interviews with top traders and find out how the most successful traders beat the markets and what are the secrets of their success. This is System Trader Podcast with your host, Jack Lempart. Rob Carver worked in the city of London for over a decade. For seven years, he was a portfolio manager at AHL, one of the world's largest systematic hedge funds before, during and after the global financial meltdown of 2008. In this interview, we talk about many trading topics, mostly around the systematic approach and why it's so important for most of us to base the decision-making process on rules rather than discretion. Rob also explains why the most important factor to consider when investing is risk. You can hear how people managing billions of dollars were considering liquidation of market positions during the 2008 crisis, while at the same time mechanical strategies made over a billion dollars in a single day. The fund's computer system had stuck to its pre-programmed set of trading rules and mechanically exploited the market moves almost to perfection, while terrified humans had discussed closing it down. Although we discussed many negative aspects of trading and investing, there's a positive message to all of us. With enough discipline and work, most of us can construct an investing vehicle at home and build our own capital successfully. On my website at systemtrader.show slash 015, you can find show notes to this episode. If you consider this material as valuable, please share it with others. Please also leave your comment on Apple Podcasts to help to reach more people. Thank you so much. I hope you will enjoy the show. Hello, Rob, and welcome to the show. Could you please introduce yourself and tell a bit about your trading career and trading experience? Okay, so my, my first trade was about 20 years ago, um, and that was the time of uh, sort of big technology boom uh, in internet stocks that was uh, you know sweeping the world. Um, so uh, I kind of dabbled in that. I didn't have very much money at the time, so uh, I would just just buy buy shares, and they they seemed to go up, and then I would sell them. So not a particularly sophisticated strategy. Uh, and then in two thousand and two, um, I actually started working for an investment bank um, as a, a fixed income options trader. Uh, I did that for about eighteen months, um, so professionally trading, and then I sp- took a couple of years off working in 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 the industry. But I was still trading my own money and kind of, uh, kind of gradually uh, getting to grips with that. And then um, after that, I got a job with AHL, which was a, a large uh, systematic um, hedge fund. And that was when I began sort of trading, you know, large amounts of money. So it's a, it was a multi-billion dollar fund. And uh, towards the end, I was actually managing the entire fixed income portfolio that was about five or six billion dollars. So, you know, very large amounts of capital. Um, I did that till 2013, so just over six years ago now, uh, and then I actually left the industry and decided to just um, kind of take it easy. So uh, I, I've still been trading my own money, though, and I, I've got a fully systematic trading strategy that trades futures, and I also have other systematic strategies which aren't automated, uh, trading ETFs and stocks. So, um, yeah, I've done done various things over the last couple of decades but i'm now very firmly in the in the systematic camp uh, of trading all right that's very impressive Uh, thank you for that rob let me diverge for a short while from the main theme of this podcast episode which is systematic trading and investing i live now in belgium for several years and was following the brexit talks for some time and yesterday there were elections in the uk so i'd like to take the occasion to ask you for an opinion you maybe have here because after all, you're British, so your perspective is um, probably different than mine. Would you agree that democracy as such, or democratic world, is in crisis, uh, so to speak? I'm not talking only about the UK, but but let's say in general. Yeah, I mean, th- there used to be this joke that that to, you know politicians were liars, and the ones who told the most convincing lies would would win the elections. And I guess that's always been true to a degree, but. Um, I think in the last few years, um, and I don't know whether you can blame it on social media or on the more polarized um, kind of mainstream media, um, but, you know, the election of Trump and the, the election we had yesterday, um, you know, it was a lot of people were telling 
some pretty big lies. And um, if you were looking in the right places, you could find people who were saying, you know what, we've fact-checked this and this isn't true. Um, but I don't think that those fact-checking messages were meeting, uh, were, were reaching the, the vast majority of people uh, because they were, were just reading the newspapers that suited their opinion or, um, you know, reading the, the Facebook posts or the Twitter posts that, that, that suited their opinion. So they were only seeing one side of the argument. They weren't seeing this kind of neutral Un- more unbiased um, opinion um, that we used to get from 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 the media. So America, I guess, is worse because they do have the very polarised um, TV uh, networks there. Um, so you know, have Fox News, which is a kind of very pro-Trump, um, and then other networks that that are uh, perhaps less biased. Uh, in the UK, at least, the, the the TV media is is relatively unbiased, but. I guess people just aren't watching TV news so much. So, um, you know, they're living in their little echo chambers. And it means that as a politician, you can get away with telling much bigger and many more lies and people will believe it and, and vote for you. I mean, it's a pretty cynical and depressing view. But, you know, when, when I woke up this morning and saw the result, I, I was I was pretty depressed. And I am still pretty depressed, to be honest, about this, the state of this country and, and politics generally. Absolutely. And do you think that the UK will leave eventually uh, European Union next year? I I have to say that that my kind of probability has probably gone up to about ninety percent. I mean, we are we are going to leave the European Union at the end of January into this transition period. the The question then is, what happens next? Um, I'm still hoping that 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 some there'll be some kind of very long and protracted negotiations at the end of which we may just go back into the EU or end up with a a deal which is you know as good well, not as good as but close enough to being in the eu that it doesn't do too much damage to the to the country but uh, i think the chances of that now are probably quite low as i said maybe 10 and there's a 90 chance that, that we're going to have a a brexit that's going to be you know either bad or really bad right i think that uh, the political reality is becoming very far from let's say economic reality which is hard to probably understand by the majority of people and they just uh, vote what they hear maybe and as you said who's the best liar is winning okay uh, so thanks for your opinion on that uh, let's return to our main theme of of this show and talk about the trading and investing um, so you said that you're now managing your uh, your portfolio using what you basically uh, learned also in the hedge fund right so uh, what you learned at HAL for example um Are you using this knowledge to some extent that the experience um, to your own uh, portfolio? Um, yes, I mean the the sort of um, there's three components to my portfolio essentially. So the the, the part that you describe as trading uh, is trading futures, um, and the approach I'm using there is very very similar to the approach that AHL was using, um, and you know the return streams have probably got a correlation of over ninety percent. Um, so that's a very similar system. Um, and then the other rest of my portfolio is is um, still run systematically, but it's it's investing rather than trading. So there's much longer holding periods. And there, my approach is, um, I guess, still based around the same principles of doing things systematically and um, thinking very carefully about things like, you know, what what sort of returns and risk are, are out there, and um, you know how how diversification can help you and And, um, how using certain kinds of keys can, can hopefully improve your return. So I, I, you know, the whole the whole piece is run very much along the same principles, but obviously the details are different depending on whether I'm I'm trading futures, which I might be holding for a, a few weeks, versus you know some some uh, ETFs, which um, you know I expect to hold for several years. Right. Do you think that working for a hedge fund is a good way to learn about investing, about trading? Um, it is. Um, I mean, it's not. It's a great way to learn. Um, I, I hesitate to recommend it because obviously it's quite hard to get a job in a hedge fund. <laughs> um, and uh, I think a lot of people that, that you see on the internet who are into trading, they're into trading, you know, their own accounts, and maybe half of them want to carry on trading their own accounts and and you know make that into a, an income stream, and the other half think that that by trading their own accounts it'll it'll get them to to get a job with a hedge fund and um so I've, i've kind of gone in the opposite direction you know i used to work for a hedge fund and now i trade my own account so um you know i i do almost certainly have more 
um, knowledge and experience than than the average trader. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to make you know many times more profit because there's a lot of luck involved. But um, I'd say that you know I've I've learned a lot, and um, principally I've learned to avoid certain key mistakes that that I guess we'll probably talk about at some point in this interview. So it's less about the fact that you know I've learned some dark magic secret at the heart of uh, hedge funds which i i can now exploit uh, with my own capital it's more that i've i've learned um through through making mistakes and also from learning from other really smart experienced people you know what what to avoid and the basic principles you should follow right i've just found out by the way that also david harding was one of the co-founder if i'm if i'm correct of hal which is a kind of uh, iconic person in the investment world but do you think that an average retail investor retail trader may learn your skills at home oh absolutely i mean they just need to to read my books i've published three books or or read my blog and um, you know if they if they did that and um you know Certainly, in terms of, for example, automating the system, they would also need to have some some skills in programming. But it's actually possible to to do a, you know the vast majority of what I do just using a spreadsheet. But um, you know, they, I'd say that someone could could read my books, read my blog, and and be kind of ninety nine percent of the way towards doing what I'm doing. I mean, there are still a few things that I I, I don't disclose, um, or some, but um, in terms of the current system I'm trading, but. You know, the vast majority of it is 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 public information. I guess what they couldn't necessarily do is then develop um, a trading system from from scratch. You know, using some perhaps new indicators, because although I've tried to pass along, you know, the sort of methodology and, and techniques I think you should follow in doing that, um, it is still I think a skill that that requires a you know a fair bit of experience and learning, um, and maybe not everybody. Could, could do that uh, but in principle yeah it's possible and uh, you said that you don't disclose some details is it because you're afraid that uh, this edge would just disappear if more people would start using it or there are some different reasons for that no it's because i i signed a, a very lengthy legal document when i joined ahl <laughs> saying that i wouldn't reveal anything that wasn't public information and uh, right. I'm, i'm still you know beholden to that So uh, yeah, I don't. It's because I don't want to get sued, basically. Sure, of course. Um, you mentioned about your books, and you're the author of three wonderful books. The first one uh, is Systematic Trading: A Unique New Method for Designing Trading and Investing Systems. Another one, uh, Smart Portfolios: A Practical Guide to Building and Maintaining Intelligent Investment Portfolios. And the latest one, which just um, was just released, Leverage Trading: A Professional Approach to Trading FX. Stocks on margin, CFDs, spread bets, and futures for all traders. Could you please tell us a bit about these books and who's the target audience? Sure. So um, I guess we can split them into two categories. So there's two books on trading, so systematic trading and leverage trading, and two books on uh, and, and a book on investing, which is smart portfolios. Um, and you know what? The lines between trading and investing are a bit blurred anyway. And in fact, you know, in, in systematic trading, I actually talk about essentially what many people would think of as investing in one of the chapters but but uh, never mind so systematic trading is um aimed at people with some experience um in in the field so if you know if you've got literally no idea how to trade you, you probably struggle to read it and it does require a little bit of a kind of uh, mathematical understanding as well although you know you don't need to know anything particularly complicated Uh, in fact, someone reviewed the book and said there are not enough equations in this book. So uh, it just goes to show you that it's not a very mathematical book. And um, it's aimed at people who have also a reasonable amount of trading capital. So, you know, in the book, I discussed some examples. And um, one of the examples is for someone who has $100,000, I think, off the top of my head. Um, and one of the examples is for someone who has 10 million euros. And then there is an example that sits between those. So, you know, it's it's not designed for the guy who's got, you know, a, a couple of thousand dollars and doesn't really know how to trade. So leverage trading is very much designed for that person. So it's designed for somebody who, who doesn't have much capital and also doesn't have as much experience. So I do go into a lot more detail about how trading of different products works. And the reason it's called, you know, leverage trading rather than systematic trading for beginners, which, you know, is a, another title you, or an idiot's guide to systematic trading, I suppose you, you could say, um, is that it's not just um, about systematic trading. It's about specifically trading leverage products. So that, you know, products where you can take leverage on. And the reason I decided to focus it on that 
was because you know that that is an area of the market where a lot of people are doing potentially dangerous things without really understanding what they're doing so i thought by by focusing on that i can help a lot of people avoid the mistake of um, you know using too much leverage or, or trading too frequently okay um so today we'll touch at least some topics from all of these books but uh, before doing that, I'd like to go back uh, for a while into your personal trading. You already mentioned uh, some details. I wanted to ask you, is your trading fully automated? I mean, every strategy you're using, is it everything automated? So uh, as I said, I've got, I've got three parts of my portfolio. So the, the futures trading, which is one part, is completely fully automated. The stock trading is systematic, but not automated. So what that means in practice is that I'm owning perhaps a dozen UK shares. I only trade UK shares in this part of my portfolio. And um, when they hit stop loss, you know, it's automatically sold. And then the process of actually buying, selecting and buying a replacement stock is something I have to do manually, although following a specific procedure. And then I have a, an ETF portfolio, which I, I rebalance every year. And again, that's a manual process, although it is systematic. So that my trading, yes, is fully automated. Exactly. Okay. And how much time do you dedicate to your own uh, trading or own investments, let's say, per day? Well, obviously, it varies. And um, I'd say in actually running my futures trading system, uh, it's probably less than five minutes. Um, okay. And that, in that five minutes, what I'm mainly doing is there are a s- series of automated emails that um, get sent by my um, computer system to me. Uh, and I'm basically checking that, that, that those emails are sort of saying that the system is running properly. So if, if, if I don't get an email or if, if an email I'm saying something's wrong, then I might need to go and look at something. Um, the other thing I need to do on a regular basis is to roll my futures contracts. So um, so right now, a lot of the futures contracts are ex- expiring mid-December. So I'm rolling those forward to you know January or the March normally expiry. Uh, that, that's something that could be automated, but, but I, I prefer to do that manually because the... The, the work involved is, is very small and it's not worth spending time writing the, the code to do it properly and robustly. As In terms of my investing portfolio, so I probably I spend a couple of days a year probably uh, rebalancing my, my ETFs. Uh, that includes also, uh, you know, for example, when I'm rebalancing, I'm doing things like trying to, um, you know, make best use of tax allowances. So I normally do that towards the end of the tax year. Um, and I'm also you know, sort of rebalancing my cash between um, various places as well. So, you know, it's partly trading I'd have to do anyway, and it's partly kind of sort of administrative activity I'd have to do anyway. And the stock portfolio, which is probably trading three or four times a year, and each three or four times a year I'll have to spend maybe half an hour selecting the new stock, buying it, um, and then just updating my spreadsheet. So, you know, had all that up, and it's probably still less than 10 minutes a day, I would say. However, however, I, I do spend then on top of that quite a lot of time writing code and researching to improve my trading system, which obviously, you know, is separate from how it's actually running. So you're still looking for a better strategies or you try to, uh, I don't know, adapt them to the uh, market changes? So it, it's a combination of things. So I kind of... Um, I'm interested in in markets from a, a sort of intellectual point of view. So there, there are things that I will spend time researching and investigating, which won't necessarily even go in my trading system because I'm just doing it as an intellectual exercise. But the, there is, then there's the the, the fact that um, the trading system, as I'm currently running it, the code's pretty old. It's it's over five years old now, and um, I'm in the process of replacing it with with new code. Uh, and that code will enable me to implement some new ideas that I have. So it's it's definitely not the one thing. It's definitely not is adapting to the current market because that's something I I believe is a complete waste of time uh, and essentially is overfitting for the kinds of trading signals I'm running, which are quite slow. So it's sort of um, it would be you know changing my system partly to try out some kind of intellectual ideas I have that I think will make the system more profitable, um, but also more interesting, and partly kind of sort of code housekeeping, if you like. Right. How about some um, holiday periods, let's say? For example, now we are just before Christmas. Are you still on the market during uh, that period? Or do you have any procedure how to be relaxed and to not think about markets, just to forget about it and just to really uh, relax? I mean, to be honest, I don't really think about markets very much at all. (laughs) 
like if it, i couldn't tell you what know what the level was of any of any stock market index and i the only reason i know where the the the, the, the for example pound dollar rate is is because you know one of the headlines this morning was that the pound dollar rallied by i think two percent uh when the exit poll was announced last night uh with the election so you know i i, I spent very little time thinking about markets in a kind of direct looking at markets kind of way i do spend a lot of time thinking intellectually about markets uh, and how they move and you know sort of strategies that would be profitable so when i go on holiday i do something that that may shock people which is i leave my system running um and um it, you know it, it runs by itself uh, it trades by itself and then i get, get get back and that could be three weeks later so you know this summer i was away for three weeks with no access to the internet or anything and um sat down and then i can see how the system has done now to do that you need to have spent a lot of time writing really robust code that that will trade without any problems you also need to have a lot of faith in in your trading system a lot of trust in what it's doing so you know if you you don't trust your system then this is not recommended you should definitely turn it off when you go on holiday um, but the other thing you need to be doing is trading fairly slowly so um, one reason i i can be relaxed about leaving my system to run for three weeks without me being there is i actually tested and said well worst case scenario is that the day after i go on holiday you know there's a power in my house or there's a problem with the internet or there's a problem with the broker and i can't trade for three weeks what effect would that have on my performance on average and the because i'm trading pretty slowly it has a very small effect on my performance um you know my we're talking about you know the sharp ratio going from perhaps one to perhaps 0.98 so i know that on average if i go away for three weeks even if something goes wrong and my system can't trade it's going to make almost no difference to my to my account value on average in practice it may go up a bit or down a bit but on average i'm pretty relaxed and the other thing you you need to have is a fairly modest risk target so um you know my annualized risk target means that over a three-week period on average i shouldn't make or lose too much money so uh, I can be relaxed that it's not going to have a big impact either way. You put in your book a statement that non-professional traders should learn from the professionals and avoid three key errors, overconfidence, overbetting and overtrading. Could you please explain? So overconfidence is uh, the fact that a lot of people really overestimate um, how good they will be at trading or how good their systems will be at trading and this is just kind of a natural human uh, instinct so um, behavioral uh, economists have a, a name for this they call it the late woebegone effect uh, because apparently there's a, a fictional town in america where everyone thinks that they're above average um, now that's fictional but actually if you ask people for example you know are you a better driver than average um, something like 90 percent of, of men certainly will say yes i'm better than average obviously that's mathematically impossible and if you ask the you know a trader are you better than average you'll probably get a similar figure maybe even higher because i I don't think a lot of people would bother trading if they didn't think they were better than average now this is kind of harmless when you're driving a car uh except when you maybe start taking risks so you maybe start driving a bit too fast for the conditions or or driving when you've had a bit too much to drink or doing some of the risky behavior and then you know you have an accident and maybe kill yourself and maybe kill other people and there's a there's an analogy here for trading because there's no harm in being overconfident when you're trading unless it causes you to do something crazy and uh, in in systematic trading the the thing that you can do that that's that's um, caused by overconfidence is overfitting your trading model so so basically if, if you go into building a a systematic trading model with very high expectations of what your profit should be um then your your fitting process is going to be you know bias towards trying to get that high performance that you think you should expect and if you don't get it then you're going to probably go down the route of overfitting the model uh, until you you get the performance that, that you think you should deserve as you're such a great trader and such a great strategy developer overconfidence then also keys into those those other two errors so overbetting is essentially taking on too much leverage and you know if you think you're a brilliant trader and if you've got a back test that where you've never lost more than five percent you might think well i can i can increase my leverage by a factor of five because you know then i'll never lose more than 25 percent. i could live with losing 25 percent. so i'll just you know use lots more leverage um and get much higher returns and you know that that's pretty dangerous and stupid in the same way that they're driving a car uh too fast because you think that you're a good driver and you can handle it it's pretty dangerous and stupid 
Uh, and then the other thing that will happen if you're overconfident is that you will you will overtrade. You will do put on too many trades, so you'll hold positions for very short periods of time. Because you know you may say, well, look, every time I trade, I have to pay a bit of commission. I have to pay a bit of a spread. But I'm such a good trader that I'll I'll easily make that money back and many times over. So you know if I if I look at my my trading and I'm trading once a week and making ten percent a year, well then if maybe I should trade once a day and I could make you know five times as much. And the, the truth is that that um, whereas your trading costs are certain and known, uh, your trading profits are very much an unknown, and you're taking a gamble by assuming that you'll make those extra profits and be able to cover those extra costs. So, so yeah, it's um, a sad fact that uh, a lot of people I think that they're much better traders than they really are. And even if you are a good trader, um, there's an awful lot of luck involved. So you you could be a good trader but unlucky. Um, so you you could be a very good driver, but but if you're dr- driving too fast, you might just be unlucky. You, you might you know someone might step out in the road when you weren't expecting it to, and uh, and you'll have a nasty accident. So um, it, it's better to to keep below the speed limit. Uh, it's better to trade conservatively. It's better to trade at a speed uh, which reflects the level of cost you're likely to pay. And it's better to have realistic expectations of what the performance of a trading strategy will be so you're not let down the path of, of overfitting. Uh, Warren Buffett said once that a number of smart people are involved in running hedge funds, but to a great extent their efforts are self-neutralizing and their IQ will not overcome the costs they impose on investors. And the investors on average and over time will do better with a low-cost index fund. Would you agree with uh, Warren Buffett with that statement? I mean, it's really, really unfair of you to ask this question to someone who used to work in a hedge fund and has many friends who still do. So, you know, how can I? I need to think of a diplomatic way of answering this question. Uh, I mean, one thing I could say straight away is that you you could argue that Warren Buffett is actually running the world's one of the world's largest hedge funds because, um, you know, uh, War, uh, Berkshire Hathaway actually uh, does use quite a bit of leverage. And uh, although I don't think they, they do short selling, they do actually use derivatives occasionally. But but anyway, let's move past that. Um, I mean, a question to ask yourself is what why why do you invest in a hedge fund? What kind of returns are you expecting to get? And, uh, you know, financial economists like to break down these returns into to different buckets. So um, there's beta. So that that's what you'd get from just investing in the market anyway. There's um, so-called alternative beta, which is what you could get from investing in um, a simple uh, long, short leverage strategies, uh, like a simple trend strategy, for example, or a simple carry strategy or a simple um, equity value strategy. Um, and then on top of that is um, alpha. So that that's the skill that that's the, the you know the high IQ that the that you're paying for when you you hire the hedge fund guys. Now the fact is that the returns of hedge funds consist of all of these things, but you have to pay fees on the whole lot together. You can't pick and choose and say you know I, I just want the alpha because um, that's the the bit that that um, is worth paying for. It's not worth um, paying for beta because I can just go and buy a, a low cost index fund. Definitely, it's not. Is it worth paying for for alternative beta? Well, that that's you know you shouldn't pay too much for it. But actually, many people can't necessarily go out and just buy alternative beta. It's actually quite quite difficult to for the average person to to put together a a strategy which will actually extract uh, you know these these risk premia. So the average person might say, well, actually, I'm happy to invest in a hedge fund because you know maybe there are beta neutral hedge funds. So I'm not going to pay for beta. They're giving me exposure to equity value, which I could get myself, but but I, I can't be bothered with the mechanics of actually going out and buying some shares and leveraging up and then shorting some other shares. Um, and then hopefully there'll be some alpha as well. Now, there has been a little bit of growth in ETFs that try and offer this alternative beta, but the, the fees on them are still quite expensive. So, you know, they, they may, they're still like maybe one and a half, two and a half percent management fee. Which is a lot more than a low cost index fund, uh, but is probably less than a you know than a than a kind of proper hedge fund. So yeah, it's a tricky one. I mean, I, for me personally, th- there's clearly no point in me investing in a hedge fund because I'm I can kind of get this alternative beta myself, um, and it doesn't cost me anything. And there are there are small economies of scale involved with hedge funds, but um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'd say on average, hedge fund investors are probably overpaying for not that much skill but then you know th- there can be an argument that it's still worth investing in them because you can get this extra source of return that, that you couldn't get necessarily get otherwise 
Right. How about mutual funds? Do you think that because you were talking about mutual funds also in your smart portfolios book, um, is it reasonable to invest money through an active fund if it's delivering um, an average uh, returns? I mean, if the fund is not beating the, the market, because now, at least uh, technically, it seems to be very easy to be an average investor. I mean, just to buy a buy an index fund. Do you think that it's reasonable to pay for 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 being just uh, to just get a average result? I mean, the argument I've just made applies even more so to mutual funds. So when you buy a mutual fund, you're essentially getting a lot of beta, which is something you can get through a low cost index fund. You're also getting what is called smart beta, which is hence the title of my book. And that that's, for example, being exposed to, um, you know, cheaper stocks, for example, or to stocks that have momentum or being exposed to, um, you know, maybe different methods of portfolio construction. And then on top, you're hopefully getting alpha. Um, but when you pay that mutual fund fee, the vast majority of returns you're getting will just be beta. There isn't really very much left over. And one of the things I try to do in smart portfolios is really say, you know, what what what's a realistic extra return to expect? from, a, say, a, 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 a fund manager who's you know running a value strategy? And then is it worth paying for if, if you don't think they have any skill, if you think they have average skill? Uh, and in the vast majority of cases, you know, um, it, it's really not worth paying for, for active funds. I mean, I, I have no active funds in my, in my portfolio at all. I, I just hold individual stocks. I hold futures and I hold ETFs, you know, because I've never seen an active fund where the returns um, are kind of sufficiently high and, and sustainably high and sufficiently high enough that they overcome the, the extra drag on fees. How about robo-advisors? Because you also mentioned uh, this kind of investment in your smart portfolio book. Could you please maybe in the first place um, explain briefly the idea behind robo-advisor and um, do you think that it makes sense to, 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 to use such a uh, vehicle? So, I mean, robo-advising is kind of one of these made-up terms. So it's not really a generally agreed uh, definition of what it means. It's a marketing term, you know, in, in the same way that smart beta and alternative beta are marketing terms. But but most people are using it in this way. If you invest with a robo-advisor, what they will do is they will buy a portfolio of ETFs. So they will buy you, a, you know, a portfolio containing maybe, uh, you know, a European stock market tracker, a US stock market tracker, uh, an Asian stock market tracker, and then the same trackers for bonds. And maybe it'll be more granular than that, and they'll go into individual countries. Um, and then what they will do is they will allocate your capital to that portfolio of ETFs according to uh, your risk preference. So if you want more risk, they'll they'll put more money into equities. If you want less risk, they'll put more money into bonds. And also, um, they'll they'll have some model predictive model of returns so they might think that that um, stocks are going to do badly next year so we're going to underweight stocks in this model so they they the 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 good news is that the the, this is not a bad thing to do um and um you know smart portfolio is essentially a book that tells you how to do this and this is how i I run this this third component of my portfolio and the 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 etfs the underlying etfs themselves are actually pretty cheap you know they're they're investing in these low-cost index funds that's great but on top of the, the low-cost um, index charge, they make their own charge for the, the fees and the service that they're providing. And I don't really believe that the fees generally are worth it. So the fees sound quite low. I mean, maybe half a percent or one percent, which doesn't sound very much. And then you do the low-cost e- ETFs underneath, add only a, f- a little bit to that. Um, but actually, for the value they're adding, it, it, it's, you know, it, it's really a very expensive way of, of getting someone to do something that actually is pretty simple for most people to do Um, and i also have some issues with the way that that some of these robo advisors actually manage their portfolios and the way that they allocate risk which i believe is fundamentally flawed and of course you can't just you can't change that unless you do it yourself you have to just take you know they offer a, a few different funds for different risk targets and you have to choose one of those you don't have any choice about about changing those parameters if you think that they're they're doing it incorrectly so if, if robo-advice was, was almost free, so if they were charging, say, I don't know, 0.05%, five basis points, I would say to a lot more people, yeah, you know, robo-advice, find a good robo-advisor who's doing things properly, using the correct methodology, go for it. But but unfortunately, unless your business is, has got huge scale, and I'm talking about, you know, sort of Vanguard um, or um, BGI sort of size scale here, 
you're unlikely to be able to run a robo advice business at that level of um, fee fee load um, because of you know the fixed cost of compliance and so on. So you know that's probably a pipe dream, sadly. At the moment, I mean, ho- you know, we've got free in the US now. There's commission free trading, so maybe we're not too far off. Uh, robo advice is being pretty cheap and actually worth going for. Right. Um, you mentioned in your book that the most important factor to consider when trading and investing is risk. And um, you say that we don't have much control over our profitability, but it is quite easy, relatively easy to control risk. How would you define uh, the risk and volatility are the synonyms and how to measure risk, how to control it? Risk is just uncertainty. It, it's, you know, if, if I invest in, in the stock market today, I know that there's a risk I will lose some money before the end of the year. Now, I kind of like to think of risk and split it two buckets. What I would call um, the risk that is being measured by a model uh, and then the risk that's outside of that model. So, you know, when, when we measure risk, we have to come up with some way of doing it. And then we, we know that, that that method that we use is probably flawed and has some, some issues, but, but and, and that probably something bad will happen, some so-called black swan that the model did not foresee. Um, but, but actually, even by using a relatively simple risk model, which is to assume that, um, you know, getting technical for a second, that all returns are, are Gaussian, uh, which means that, you know, that, that they're symmetric and that unusually large returns are rare. Which is a massive simplification because we, you know, we just have to look at stock market and we see many, many times that, you know, someone will be on the news and say, "Well, this was a, a seven or a eight standard deviation event." So clearly, something that shouldn't really happen in this very simplified uh, risk model view. Um, but the, but it's still even with that very simple risk model. So you know, had measuring risk by measuring the annual standard deviation um, of returns, which is which assumes symmetry, which assumes Gaussian returns. Even doing that, um, you can still predict risk, uh, you know, really well. So if you look at the, you know, the returns over the last month, you can predict with a very high degree of accuracy how risky the, the returns of that asset will be over the next month, even if your risk model is uh, is really simple. So yeah, I, I, I personally, I mean, different people do this differently, but I, when I say volatility, I mean a specific measure of risk, of, uh, which is you know standard deviation. Uh, when I say risk, I mean, you know, anything that could happen, so which both inside and outside the model. All right. I'd like to talk a bit about trading stars. In your first book, you, you put a paragraph about that. And to take an occasion to, to explain more some uh, details behind it, let's say I'd like to talk about different flavors of trading or investing, for example. And the first, uh, let's say, flavor uh, you put in your book was static investing static uh trading versus dynamic could you please um, briefly explain what is behind it this is the idea that um what's the simplest thing you can do the simplest thing you can do is just buy something and hold on to it forever and that would be the most static portfolio uh that, that you could have and a dynamic portfolio will be would be where you were trading that um you know continuously for various reasons and there, there are sort of that's i guess fairly well understood but the, there are actually shades uh, between that so for example if you you can hold a portfolio uh, of an asset but if you think that the risk of that asset is is going to change you may want to change the size of your position you don't have any forecast about whether it's going to go up or down in price it's just the, the risk that you that you're worried about so you can go from having a portfolio that's static to having one that's a bit more dynamic because it's it's just looking at, at the at the risk uh, that's happening so that that's important because when it comes to benchmarking your uh, your trading, a lot of people benchmark against a pure static portfolio. So they, they benchmark against the market index, and they say, "Well, you know, I'm I'm doing really well because uh, I've I've done all this trading, and uh, you know, the market index has has gone down." But a, a fairer comparison is is perhaps to say, "Well, you know, just just targeting your risk, just changing your position for risk." can actually add quite a lot of value to your portfolio, but it doesn't require any skill. It's just a simple uh, mechanical task. So what you should really do is benchmark yourself against against a portfolio where that's happening. Uh, and I think that's a really a good move towards the idea of what I was saying earlier, which is, you know, when you're distinguishing how much skill a manager has or you have, or your trading strategy has, you know, you really want to strip out all the things that, that could be done very easily by, by somebody else just to focus on and on the additional value that's being added by 
you know, your forecasting of, of what returns are going to be in this case. How about positive versus negative skew? Because you mentioned in your in your book uh, different types of strategies like trend followers, uh, trend following, and mean reversion. Uh, or maybe in the first place, if you could briefly explain what the skew notion is and uh, why we should care about it. So skew is uh, you know a fancy mathematical way of saying that that your returns are not symmetric. So positive skew means that you are likely to have more losing days than winning days but your winning days are going to be big so you, you win big and lose small and a, a cla- you know trend following is a classic example of this so you know if you look at say my own track record over the last uh, five six years there's been uh, a couple of years uh, when i've made pretty decent profits and i'm thankful to say that the last year has, has been one of them so far touch wood and then the other years were kind of small down or flat uh, and that's pretty pretty much what you expect when you look at a trend following type of strategy. The opposite of positive skew is is negative skew, and that's where you have more winning days than losing days. But you and um, you know an example of, of trading strategy like that would be um, an FX carry strategy, where you know you generally make steady profits, and then in a situation like two thousand and eight, you get absolutely carried out. If you're doing any kind of uh, strategy where you're you're sort of biased towards uh, selling options as well, you'll tend to make small profits every day uh, and then lose big when the market moves a lot. If you're running a kind of market making or mean reversion type strategy where you expect to be buying, you know, the market's in a range, you're buying low, selling high, you'll make small profits within that range. But when the market breaks out of that range, you'll make a big loss. Now, this is an important distinction to make because um, it's really important to know what kind of trading you're doing. An analogy I like to say is, are you buying insurance or selling insurance? So if you're buying insurance, you've got a positive skew strategy. Because if I, I'm currently paying an insurance premium on my house, a little bit of money every year, but if there's a fire or some kind of natural disaster, I'll, I'll get a, you know, a, big, a big return, which will compensate me, obviously, for my house burning down. The insurance company has the opposite uh, kind of uh, risk profile. So, you know, they make a little bit of money every year from these premiums that are being paid in. But then, of course, uh, you know, when a house does burn down, they have a, they'll have a big payout. Insurance companies can do this because, you know, they've got a big diversified pool of, um, of, of, of uh, people who are buying insurance off them. But, but I think a lot of people uh, don't understand this distinction. And um, they'll often do things like run a, a negative skew trading strategy and think, well, this is great because I'm making money every day. This is brilliant. This is fantastic. I'm some kind of genius. Um, and it'll work for, for a few weeks or a few months or even a few years. And then, uh, you know, a, a big tail event will happen and they will lose a lot of money. And that's not necessarily a problem if you understand that you're running a negative skew strategy and you've kind of got your risk set up such that you can survive that that big loss. But, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, that that's, you know, what they're doing. They underestimate the likely size of a big loss. Uh, and then when the market does change against them, they will lose a lot of money very quickly. So it, generally speaking, it's a lot easier to risk manage uh, a positive skew trading strategy because you, you most of the time you're losing money. So you kind of have a good feel for what your likely losses are. Uh, and when those big gains come along, that's great. They go in the bank. But when you're running a negative skew strategy, it's a lot harder to know what your likely potential losses could be, uh, and therefore you should be a lot more cautious with, with you know, with your use of leverage, for example. But from the psychological point of view, probably the strategy which has a positive uh, skew is harder to trade because people like to be right, right? And here we often have uh, small losses, which people probably don't like, and they prefer probably a negative skew because, as you said, they think they are brilliant until uh, they will get the first big big loss i really like the the example you you provided uh, with the with that uh, company insurance company yeah this is a really fascinating debate because um you're right it's really really hard to run a positive skew tra- trading strategy uh, and one of the reasons why i think trend following works is that because it's positive skew a, a lot of people are uncomfortable with with you know with as many small losses uh, you're absolutely right but on the other hand Generally speaking, people do not like negative skew, so um, they prefer positive skew. 
So if you were to say to somebody, you know, do you play the lottery? A lot of people say, yeah, I, l- I like to play the lottery. Even though on average you lose money, you're holding out for that big win. And that big win is a, a classic piece of positive skew. You know, you've got small losses. Every time you pay the lottery, you spend a few euros on a ticket. There's that hope that you'll get a big prize and that big return. So that's very much a positive skew strategy and people like that. So it's a it's a very interesting um, kind of dichotomy in, in the way that people think. Uh, you know, because in theory... If you like playing the lottery, you should also like trend following. But in, in practice, because trend following isn't offering you, you know, a chance of a, a 10 million euro payout on buying a two euro ticket, the, 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 the psychology works a, a bit differently. So, yeah, it's a, a very interesting thing to think about. So do you think that trend following works because of the human biases? The, 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 I mean, about because of the uh, psychological psychological biases? Yes, I do. I mean, one one. Um, one advantage of of not being an econo- uh, you know uh, working for a university is i don't actually care why it works i don't need to care why it works i just ha- have to hope that it continues working uh but yeah my own kind of pet theory is definitely that it's around psychological biases absolutely but do you think that it's good then to put in the portfolio um we'll we'll say about uh, more about the portfolio construction later but do you think that it's good to have in portfolio uh, both types both flavors of the t- strategy so for example uh, we have a trading uh, a trend following and then we are trading also mean reversion strategy which is more uh, ne- uh, having a negative skew Yeah, I mean, one of the key the key messages that I always go on about is that diversification is a good thing. So diversification on, against across different trading styles is absolutely a good thing. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I do have things in my portfolio that that have negative skew, but um, you know, I I would say that if I was running a portfolio that was you know ninety percent negative skew, I'd be really concerned, and I probably wouldn't be able to go on a holiday relaxed. Uh, you know the way I can now, but you know, but I'm running maybe twenty to twenty five percent negative skew, so that that's kind of a a nice diversification, but it's not yet at a level where it's it's started to scare me. So yeah, absolutely, you know, diversify across different kinds of return, but you just have to be a lot more careful with that with that negative skew stuff. How about technical versus fundamental analysis? I mean, I'm still uh, talking about the trading styles because. For example, technical analysis has a bad reputation, probably maybe due to very naive way, uh, which is used by uh, how is used by retail traders. Um, so I wanted to ask you how about how about this uh, different flavors between the technical and fundamental, and is technical analysis used by hedge funds as well? Yeah. So um, yeah, again, this is one of those things. There's no agreed definition on, but but I guess te- technical analysis for me at least means using the price. Or some transformation, or some function of the of the price series. Now, fundamental analysis to me then is everything else. So, for example, if you're trading stocks, you might use you know earnings to price ratios or dividend yields. You know, I've, I've at times have looked at using macroeconomic data. So that would be you know things like unemployment, uh, inflation, and interest rates. You know, so you know there's there's a whole variety of, of, of things you could use as well as prices. Now, you're right, technical analysis generally um, has a bad reputation. Um, but actually, the vast majority of you know, professional traders in hedge funds and elsewhere are using some technical analysis, and in some cases, exclusively using technical analysis. And there's a, there's a, there's a few reasons why this is the case. And one is that it's, it's actually a lot easier uh, if you've just got one kind of data coming in. So for me, as an, you know, someone who's now trading my own money without any help from anybody else, you know, I just have to worry about the, the price of uh, the things I'm trading. If I also had to, to worry about a lot of, you know, accounting information and things like that, um, you know, systematically collecting that data and making sure there were no mistakes in it, that's an awful lot of work to do. So, you know, the fact that in my automated system, I just use technical analysis is is great. As it happens in my non-automated systems, I do use fundamental data because I, you know they're, they're not purely automated; it's not generating any extra work for me. So that, that's why technical analysis is popular, I think. And there's nothing wrong with technical analysis. There's nothing wrong with with using a price series to predict what will happen to prices in future. Uh, it's just that, that there are people doing it in in kind of very wacky ways. And actually, very much in non-systematic ways. So you know, there are guys staring at charts and saying, "Oh, look, I can see a, a you know, a, a leaping dragon or a, a dead baby or a, a, something like this." And that's that's clearly all, all you know. Oh, look, it's reaching a, a clear 
a sort of key Fibonacci level. I mean, this is all nonsense. This is all complete nonsense. There's no evidence that any of this stuff works. Uh, it will only work in a self-reinforcing way. In other words, if enough people believe it, then it will work. But there's no reason why it should work. At at best, the, these techniques are just say finding trends because you know you can use a number of different ways to find the trend and actually if i showed you a chart and said is there a trend there you would say yes or no that's just kind of simple pattern recognition uh, but you can do that with really simple um technical indicators like you know moving average crossovers and uh, th- there's absolutely nothing wrong with that it's just a systematic way of, f- of finding a trend because if you believe that markets trend then your system will be profitable how you find those trends is less important so there's no, there's nothing wrong with technical analysis. There's an equally nothing wrong with fundamental analysis. And actually, in terms of diversification, if I had a you know a staff of ten people working for me, I would be using fundamental and technical analysis um, because I would expect that to, to improve my my returns because I'm getting two different kinds of information that should improve my trading. Um, the only reason I'm not, I said, is because I'm, I'm um, it would be a lot of work and just for one person, and I'm I'm pretty lazy. How about trading speed? Because um, that's another big topic. And uh, for example, re- retail traders, they quite often think that uh, the, the, the right way to go is is day trading. Uh, do you think that trading less frequently is easier and gives more chances to be profitable in the long run? I mean, the analogy I like to use is, is uh, imagine that, that you know, you're, you've gone for a run and um, you, know, you, you decided to, to run into a really stiff headwind and it's really slowing you down. That's what day trading is like. That headwind is, is, is costs. It's additional costs that you definitely have to pay. So you're really going to have to be a really good runner to get a, to get a decent time and, and push, push through that, that headwind. If you trade more slowly, then the headwind will reduce until it's nothing more than a gentle breeze. So you know, you're automatically making life much more difficult for yourself. By, by trading more frequently because you have to pay higher costs. Now, it might be, of course, that, that you do have a, a trading strategy that, that, that can do that. And um, there are strategies out there. Um, and um, you know, there, there, are, there are big hedge funds running those kinds of strategies. I'm not saying they don't exist. But for the vast majority of people, it's much easier and simple to say, well, I'm, I'm, I don't want to, I'm not going to try and compete with those guys. You know, apart from anything else, they're probably paying lower costs than me. They're paying lower commissions. Maybe they're a member of the exchange, and they're, you know, they're not having to pay any kind of access fees. You know, maybe they're executing their trades in such a way they don't have to pay. Uh, you know, the spread. It's crazy to try and compete with people like that by by trading. In my opinion, um, you know, just make life easy for yourself and pay much lower costs, and then you're much more likely to find a strategy that that can can pay those costs and hopefully make profits on top. Right, because I think that the common thinking of retail trader is that. If he trades more often, he has more opportunities to make money. So trading less means less money. That's, I think, the, the common common uh, thinking. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the other point I'd make and, um, is, is that um, markets behave differently at different um, sort of tra- hor- time horizons. So uh, most markets um, seem to trend for holding periods of between a few weeks and about a year. If you go um, much faster than that, they they tend to show more mean reverting behavior. Now, if you're also if you're so if you're a day trader and you're you're trying to to sort of trend follow the market uh, on a daily basis, you know you, you're you're doing something that's a bit stupid because the, generally speaking, the most strong trending behavior is shown in much longer trading horizons than that. Uh, and the other thing is because you're trend following. When you see a trend appearing, you're going to have to execute your order immediately at the market and, um, you know, cross the spread. So you're going to be paying even higher trading costs than, than you would anyway. So, you know, it's really difficult to, to make money day trading, I would say. I'd like to talk a bit about systematic trading as such. And if someone would ask you to explain what systematic trading is all about, how would you answer I mean, it's trading systematically. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's using a system to trade. So, um, you know, it's it's um, not always following a, a, a process that's written down that has very strict rules. So the, the definition I like to give is if your process could be traded by a computer, by a computer program, then it must be systematic. It doesn't have to be traded by a computer. You could use a spreadsheet or, you know, a calculator to, to do the calculations um, and then do the trading manually. Um, but as long as you're absolutely following those rules strictly, uh, then it's it's still systematic trading. So if if you've got a trading process where, for example, you know you you um, come up with a number of users like a screen to come up with a number of possible trades, a systematic screen that's great. 
if you then ch- sort of have a gut instinct and choose the one you think will do the best, well, then you're no longer trading systematically. You're doing a kind of hybrid between the two. So pure systematic trading that, you know, a computer could do it with no human intervention because everything is written down uh, with a with a completely um, kind of complete algorithm. Anything anything that involves any discretion or human judgment yeah, isn't. Because I've got an impression that uh, at least some people are having uh, misunderstand. I mean, they misunderstand the the whole concept beho- behind the systematic trading, and they more focus here on the automation of the process. I mean, automation of transmitting the orders on the market rather than in the first place on having something reasonable to to automate and to have a reliable strategy to to control risk and they think that they just i can you can maybe see this on the internet as well that people are looking for an expert advisor uh they just will plug it in and just will go on holiday and will have a lot of money made out of it so i think that this is a big misunderstanding of of that thing that systematic trading doesn't have to mean that it's Uh, fully automated i mean that it's running on the computer uh, it doesn't have to be exactly that that case and in your book systematic trading you you put three groups of traders or investors uh, the first one was uh, is asset allocating investor another one is semi automatic trader and the third one staunch system trader could you please describe this types of uh, systematic traders so the key the key difference between these three groups is their view on how predictable the markets are so asset allocating investors believe that that you cannot predict the returns in the market they they say you should just give up so if you can't predict the returns in the market what should you do well, the answer is you should have a uh, a diversified portfolio of of assets that expose you to you know to different things so You know, the cl- a classic portfolio we discussed earlier that a robo investor might might uh, suggest of of you know bonds and equity funds from from different countries but then it's then it's taken a step further by saying well actually as we've discussed volatility is very predictable and therefore it makes sense to actually adjust the allocation of of that static uh, portfolio according to uh, changes in volatility so the the the, the asset allocated investors they can't believe what mark can't trust predict returns but i can predict volatility and i can also predict correlation which tells me how uh, you know different market returns move together so using that information what's the best kind of portfolio i can hold well it's a portfolio where you assume that all assets have the same risk adjusted return but they you know the where risk might change and you could predict that which means that you would reduce your allocation to assets with the risk has gone up vice versa um and it also means you would you would try and hold a portfolio that that diversifies you a lot semi automatic traders uh have a different belief on how predictable markets are they believe that they personally can predict market returns they believe that computers cannot they believe that a, a systematic strategy cannot do as good a job as they can um at predicting where market returns are going to go however they are very comfortable with the idea that um a you should use a system for sizing your positions and managing your risk so what what they they can do using the system i outline in in my first book and also in the final chapter of my of my of my third book leverage trading what they can do is is come up with uh, some quantified estimate for you know how they think different things will do so they might say you know on a score from minus 10 to 10 Um, I'm minus eight on on uh, the dollar, which means I'm really bearish on the dollar. I'm plus two on the on euro stocks. I'm a little bit bullish on euro stocks, and so on. Uh, and then I, you know, they can use a simple algorithm, which will essentially convert those forecasts into uh, positions, which can then be managed by a system in terms of their size and their risk and uh, stop losses, uh, if if relevant. So um, they they kind of think that that the trading, the skill of trading, has two components. One only humans can do, which is predicting where markets will go. But and, and then a second part that actually computers can, or a system can do much better, which is in terms of risk and position sizing. Semi uh, that's semi automatic traders. So a staunch system trader is someone who who firmly believes that a computer is best at managing risk, but also at actually taking the decision about where the market should go. So that that's like that's basically my, you know where I sit. You know, um, and uh, I, I actually think, yeah, you should use a system to do everything to predict where the market's going, to size your positions, and so on and so forth. So I use these three categories in the book to sort of say to to people, look, well, you may not believe like I do 
that computers make the best traders. You don't have to believe that to use a system. In some, you know, you can either use a system like like a to do your asset allocation if you believe markets are unpredictable, or if you think that you've got some kind of gut instinct about how you trade. Well, that's fine. I, I don't necessarily uh, believe that that I have that instinct, but but you'll do much better as a trader if you do follow a system when it comes to you know managing the the risk of your positions. Right. So I think that uh, to me, very interesting was this uh, semi-automatic trader because apparently someone who's let's say um, discretionary trader. It seems that he still can ra- can be seen as a systematic trader, uh, just following some framework uh, to control the risk, um, to, to control the bet sizing. Um, there's a very interesting story in your book, uh, the Systematic Trading, um, describing a day from September 2008 when all markets were plunging. And at the time you were working for um, HAL and... Um, and people, as far as I remember, in the hedge fund were considering even closing some market positions because uh, it was very high risk and everyone was saying in the media what's happening. And at the same time, the, the, the system, the, the mechanical, mechanical trading strategy made over a billion dollars in a single day. Tell us a bit more about that. I mean, especially in the context of computers versus the humans and the decision making process. Tell us please more about uh, how it was to be in the middle of that gigantic financial crisis, I mean, in 2008, and how it looked from a perspective of a quant trader uh, working for a huge uh, hedge fund. I mean, being in the middle of financial crisis was was pretty uh, pretty special. Um, I mean, it was obviously, uh, you know, in many ways a horrific event, and a, a lot of damage done to, to people's jobs and livelihoods. Um, but but you know it was it was an incredible experience and um, although it was very stressful at the time I, I kind of it, it, it was it's, you know it's, it was something to say you were there um, now I, I guess being in the middle of of, of um, the financial industry we kind of knew probably even a, a year a year and a half before that that, that there were signs that things were going wrong um, so although you know the equity markets for example kind of carried on going up. Um, it, you know, for all of 2017 and even the first part of 2018, there were other markets that we were monitoring, you know, the credit markets where um, things were, were getting very dicey, you know, way back in, in sort of early 2017. So that the crisis didn't really kind of come as a surprise or as a shock, uh, as it may have done to people in the outside world who weren't following things as closely. But but every, every day seemed to bring a, a kind of, oh, my God, is this really happening moments? You know, we, it was just things that, that seemed was completely unprecedented and um you know the, the one thing i say to people uh, in terms of trading a system is that you absolutely have to trust your system uh, you absolutely have to trust it and um one of the the reasons why not many people trade systematically is that is the hardest thing in the world to do because you know in, in especially in a situation like that you look around and you think well the world's gone completely mad how can a computer system that's that's operating fairly simple trading rules that we know have worked for quite a long period of time because we've tested them and run with these. Actually, I mean, at the time, AHL had been running um, for um, over twenty years. How do we? How can we be sure that that this thing can cope in this environment? Um, and just just so many crazy things happening. So it's a very strong human instinct to say, you know, we we can't. We just we just have to do something about this. We can't let this computer carry on trading in this environment. It's, it's too dangerous. Um, especially as you know the, the amounts of money involved are colossal and it's other people's money so you know if if something did go wrong you'd, you'd feel a very strong sense of responsibility to all the people who, whose money you'd lost and so you know it was only natural that we were we were kind of going well you know okay the the, the system is running a very high level of risk at the moment I, you know it's right it's it's managing its risk the way it should do it the, the system's doing everything it should do you know there were no bugs in the code um, and in fact, it was it was profitable, um, and as you say, on one day, extraordinarily profitable. So, a billion dollars. I put it in the book to sound like a lot of money. Uh, in percentage terms of the fund's value, it was about six percent, uh, which may not sound very much, but you know, for, for the kind of fund we were running, that was a that was a you know record profit. We'd never seen a profit that size before. So, um, you know, we one of the if we talked about David Harding. In fact, Winton um, made the decision at the time to cut their risk. Um, to lower levels because they didn't want to be in a, a situation where they could lose, you know, a large proportion of their clients' money. Uh, we were having the same discussion, the same debate. And um, 
you know we were we were panicking and we weren't trusting our system and we were you know had very itchy fingers wanting to to not turn it off completely but at least reduce the risk it was running and the system doesn't know about any of this it just carries on trading and uh does its thing and uh you know 2008 was a, an extraordinary a very profitable year but do you think that for a systematic trader it's easier to go through such big crises uh rather than for discretionary trader um yes or maybe the yeah, opposite yeah well i mean I, it's i guess it's it depends on your psychological makeup so if you're a very good discretionary trader and then you're probably a pretty cool customer um and you'll you know you you'll be able to cope with the the ups and downs of the market even even perhaps uh, the kind of things that are happening in 2008 uh, but I, I think for the average person, if you can resist the temptation not to let the system keep running, and th- this is where automation actually is an advantage, because um, if you have to manually run your system, the temptation to to not do certain trades, not to trade at all because the market's gone crazy, is ex- is extremely difficult to resist. If the system is just running, you know, I mean, I, I could shut down my system in in five minutes just by typing in a line of code. So I, you know. It's not. It's not like it's possible to shut down my system, but I had have to make an active decision t- to do it. So I, I think um, for most people who don't have that that really um, you know strong kind of psychological uh, makeup, who can handle stress to that level, um, most people probably would be better off running a system with the caveat that they really do have to let it keep running by itself, which is easier if it's automated. Definitely. So if you don't trust yourself, it's maybe better indeed to have everything automated and shut down the computer. I mean, not to watch what the market is doing and just uh, religiously uh, follow the, 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 the strategy, actually, to let to do it, um, the, the computer to do the, its job. Yeah, I mean, you have to trust the system, not yourself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but do you think that um, let's say that if you if you as a person you know that you are prone to you know to not follow the strategy, then do you think that indeed automating that process may be helpful if you don't trust yourself? Absolutely, definitely. You mentioned in your um, books that there are two ways to find trading rules. Um, the first approach is called data first, and another one, the second one is called idea first. Could you please explain? Yeah, so ultimately, um, you know, the, the process of finding a trading strategy is you, you want to come up with, um, you know, some rule, uh, with probably with some parameters. So a very a simple rule might be something like, uh, you know what 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 is the return for the last n days where n is a parameter uh, and if that's positive then go long and if it's negative then go short that'll be a very simple trading rule so um the question is you know how do you come up with these rules how do you fit the parameters so the the the, the way that a lot of people imagine that you do it and actually i think especially with the availability of of uh, you know tools to do this now quite easily uh, even on a sort of standard desktop computer um, is you the data you have a big big pool of data and then you have some kind of algorithm that essentially looks at that data and then comes up with a with a trading rule that will perform well on that data um, so something like a neural network perhaps the alternative approach is to not start with the data but to say right i have a hypothesis that this particular trading rule will work so i have a hypothesis that if you if the market trended for the last two weeks it will keep trending so you start with with this hypothesis or this idea, and then you go to the data and you test it to see if it works. So you know that those are the the, the two kinds of, of ways of of, uh, of doing things. So as I said, data first is the way that a lot of people seem to think uh, you should do things. Ideas first is, in my experience, uh, usually uh, a lot more successful because the temptation with data first uh, is that you will. Um, you know, end up overfitting uh, and finding a trading strategy that's that's really complicated, has a lot of parameters, uh, and did very well in the past, but is unlikely to do well in the future. So, do you think that there's it's a bit problematic to use uh, some fancy techniques like um, genetic programming algorithms or machine learning or other? let's say, artificial intelligence applications in general. Because I saw uh, um, review of uh, your review of uh, uh, Marcos Lopez de Prado book, uh, Advances in Financial Machine Learning, where you said that, for example, uh, I will just quote it, uh, the more black box nature of machine learning also means that the sins of overfitting may be easily hidden from view. 
So I, I've got a feeling that you are a bit skeptical about uh, applications of artificial intelligence. And also I had on the other side a different view that the genetic algorithms, for example, where as an input we have uh, historical data and someone was claiming that it may be a good idea because because uh, because algorithm doesn't have a human biases so it may come up with let's say a non-standard idea which we as a human beings wouldn't 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 think of i would say that my main bias against these fancy techniques is it's very easy to to use them badly and to whether that you know to to overfit them essentially so a lot of the people who are using them do not know what they are doing and that's why you know I, I, marcus's book is so good because it tells you how to do things properly but but you know I, i've heard people say to me oh well i, I wanted to, to you know use machine learning i say well buy marcus's book and they come back and say well it's a bit i can't understand it. it's too difficult i'm like well in that case you, you know you should not be doing machine learning but they're like well all i need to do is put the data into this this software program i've downloaded off the internet and it will give me the answer you know i don't need to read marcus's book i'm like you really should not be doing this because you know and this is the problem so there's nothing wrong with machine learning per se and i can give you a few different situations in which um it's actually a, a good thing i would say but you really need to know what you're doing so so the, what what are the where are the places of machine learning might make sense so um it makes a lot of sense i think if you're uh, sort of a more of a high frequency trader so i know a lot of um hedge funds quant hedge funds who are not using machine learning in their main kind of strategy of, of sort of predicting where markets are going to go but what they are doing is is their execution algorithms working at a much higher frequency with those they are using machine learning because they're higher frequency there's a lot more data available so it's it's a, a lot more likely that, that they'll be able to find something meaningful there so that's the first instance i had i, I know of um some banks um using um you know um machine learning to do kind of what sort of things that are a, a bit left field and a bit more interesting so an example would be let's say that that you had a lot of um kind of accounting ratios um and you wanted to think of a way of saying well which ratios are important uh, in terms of selecting which stocks should do well um now that that sort of stuff is quite hard to do with sort of your standard classical econometric techniques it's, so things like you know this actually this is a clustering problem you know, you, you, you know, there are the machine learning techniques that do that really well, um, and will do a, a better job of it than, than say, running a regression, which is the way that people usually used, you know, kind of cope with this problem. Um, so that that's an example where where uh, you know a judicious use of machine learning can give you a you know a, a good good sensible result. And um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I mean, actually, yeah, coming back to to, to what you said yourself, you know. It's it's possible that a, 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 a machine learning is a very another one of these very well defined terms. But let's say a, a non-linear uh, fitting technique will find a pattern that a linear fitting technique will not, or a human being wouldn't see or expect, or you know, prime the the, the fitting model to find. Um, and there are, I think that that's more likely in the high frequency world. It's more likely, um, you know, when you, you the the data is very non-linear. So there there are, there are those things out there, but. Um, uh, so the vast majority of people um, who are who are trading, you know, using machine learning is at best complete overkill, and at worst will will just you know lead them down a, a rabbit hole of of overfitting their models without really understanding what they're doing. But do you think that in general, I know it's simplification, but do you think that for artificial intelligence as such, because I also was uh, studying a computer science, so basically sometimes we see marketing uh, words that say that this is a so brilliant new technology, but actually the theory behind that is pretty old. It, it Sometimes it, it has decades. And do you think that still for, our, um, for artificial intelligence, there is a future in terms of uh, for in the investment world, so to speak? I mean, of course, there's a future for it. I mean, uh, part of the problem is it's hard to define what all of these terms mean. So people say, oh, do you use machine learning? I'm like, no. Um, I say, but yeah, I do I do re regressions and I do this, that and the other. I do these sort of classical statistical techniques. And they're like, oh, well, that's machine learning. I'm like, well, if you say so. So, I mean, artificial intelligence perhaps is a, a bit a bit more of a kind of well-defined term. I mean, I, I don't, I, I see, I think there's a future in it, but I don't think that, that it will be the case that you will not, let's say, in, in 10 or 20 years' time, uh, if you say something like, oh, in 20 years' time, you won't be able to be able to trade it without knowing how to use artificial intelligence. I fundamentally disagree with that. Uh, I think you'll, you'll be able to do a, 
a, you know, a good job of, of fitting the vast majority of um, systematic training strategies using techniques that are actually over 100 years old. So, um, you know, I, I'm not saying it won't be important, and I'm not saying there aren't areas where it's where now actually it will give you a an edge. Um, but you know, gen- generally speaking, that's still going to be quite a small part of the market even going forward. So do you think that there's, in fact, a limited number of rules which work on the market? So that's why maybe this approach, idea first, maybe uh, make maybe it's more uh, reasonable, especially for someone who's not a big fund and is just like, uh, I don't know, a single person just trading its own money. So just it's better to focus on this idea first approach and 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 use in own trading the things which are really proven uh, and and it's known that it's work. It's been working for even uh, a centuries. I mean, that's my personal view. I mean, the the problem is that everyone has this dream that they will somehow be able to find this this undiscovered trading rule that no one else has ever found, because they've they've even though they've got the same machine learning package and the same data that everybody else has got, but they'll find this rule that no one else has found and they'll be able to make you know ridiculously high profits from it. I just think for the, you know, for, 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 for almost everybody in the world, apart with the exception of a very small number of hedge funds, I mean, we could talk about Renaissance, we could talk about DE, sure. But for the vast majority of people, you know, that that is not likely to happen. You put a nice story in your book uh, about the uh, Aqueduct Capital, a local proprietary trading firm. And uh, you were just describing that as a peril, I mean, an example of perils of fitting um, how it can go uh, really wrongly. Would you have a problem to trade a system which is hard to explain, although maybe it has outstanding results in the backtest? That was just the case from that your story about the aqueduct capital from, from your book. Yeah, I mean, I, I would personally struggle to trade a, a system which I couldn't explain, definitely. And that that's the problem with this you know these fancier techniques um you know you, uh, something can come out the other end you don't really understand what it's doing or or why it's making money and that, that that's um you know co- co- i wouldn't personally trust that with my money and i certainly wouldn't trust it with somebody else's money you know if i was still trading other people's money how much data is needed for system testing is there any let's say minimal number of transactions to trust the system that we know that indeed it it may be something in it and uh, we can try to run it uh with real money a lot a lot more than you think so um the the there's, there's actually a mathematical equation um you can use to calculate this but basically there's two factors that go into it one is what the the kind of real performance of the strategy is and and how and um if if your strategy is really really good so you know most likely um if if you're running say a high frequency trading firm you can probably get away with using a a month or a couple of months worth of data uh, because that two months will be actually you know millions of transactions probably um anyway and uh, it's because it's very profitable that also means there's like you know the kind of signal to noise ratio uh, is going to be very high Uh, but if you're dealing in the, the kind of world where where i am where i'm trading much slow more slowly and also where the performance of any individual component of my trading strategy is, is, you know, probably just about barely distinguishable from noise. You know, you do need to have, you know, a lot, a lot of data. And I would say ideally decades worth of data. Um, and that, that means, for example, that you also want to be fitting across lots of different instruments at the same time. So that, you know, that increases the amount of data that, that you're using. So that makes it hard, for example, to, to do something that a lot of people think you should do. Which, which is generally a mistake, which is to train all of your instruments a bit differently and to, to you know, to, to fit them individually and have different parameters for each of them. Uh, generally speaking, that's a bad idea. And what you should be doing is, is, you know, using all the data you have to fit a single model that you can apply to everything. Oh, we could talk a couple of days, but just shortly, if you could explain what is portfolio optimization and how could you also explain uh, what bootstrapping is, how it helps in portfolio optimization? So portfolio optimization is is just the way of saying how much of my money is going to be allocated to different things. Um, and those things could be, um, it, you know, you, you could have a portfolio of stocks. So you could say I want to buy, you know, um, all the stocks in uh, in, the, in the Eurostox 50. But, it, you know, what should I, should I put, um, you know, 2% in each stock or a little bit less or a little bit more? could be a portfolio of ETFs, which we've, we've also talked about, or it could actually be a portfolio of trading strategies. So you could have a 
uh, a trading strategy for gold, a trading strategy for S&P 500, a trading strategy for euro stocks, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then you need to decide how much money you put into each of those. So what, what kinds of things should you consider when you're doing that? Well, you need to consider the, the, the risk that they have. So, you, you know, we need to put less money into things that are riskier. Um, when we're doing that with trading strategies, we don't have to worry about that because um, trading strategies, when built properly, all, should all have the same uh, long run expected risk. Uh, we also need to worry about correlations, so how how similar the, these things are. So you know, we really want to put together portfolios that are diversified and have the maximum amount of diversification within them. Um, so you know, that means adding strategies that do something a bit different from what you've already got. You know, like for example, as we said, adding a little bit of negative skew to a, a positive skew uh, suite of strategies. And the other thing you, you you may want to consider is is how the, the expected return of these things expected risk adjusted return so you want to put more money to things that you expect to do better than others that's quite difficult um, because generally speaking it's much harder to predict risk risk adjusted returns than it's to predict risk or correlation um, so one of the, the the tricks is to try and use a technique that will properly account for the uncertainty involved with uh, you know with, with estimating these things that tell you what kind of portfolio you should have and bootstrapping is one of those techniques uh, and what you do with bootstrapping is you basically say um, that what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to come up with um, a number of different scenarios as to how my back test could have turned out by randomly choosing, you know, dates from the past and, and putting those together to create new account curves. And then I'm going to do optimize my portfolio for each of these. So I, I might do this 10,000 times. I've got 10,000 different versions of history in which the back test turned out slightly differently. And, you know, in some cases, I'd put more money into gold and less into euro stocks and, and vice versa. And then to actually work out what weights I should be using, I take an average across all of those um, al- uh, alternative histories, if you like. Uh, this is a really um, sim- quite simple uh, and, and, and relatively robust way to ensure that your portfolio optimization is taking account of the fact that, you you know, you've got a lot of uncertainty in your estimates. And it makes it much less likely that you will, your optimization will come out with very extreme portfolio weights. So, you know, the kind of standard portfolio optimization tools will tend to do crazy things like put, put all the money into one asset or one trading strategy because it only has, has a slightly higher return than the others. And they think, well, it's got a slightly higher return. Let's put everything in that. That doesn't account for the fact that that slightly higher return is probably not statistically significant if you do bootstrapping then it will put a little bit more money into that strategy a little bit less into the others but it won't go you know 100 percent. right thank you rob for that i have a couple of various questions let's say what tools do you use for your personal uh, trading um i mean here the programming languages or software packages or maybe brokers if you want to say that publicly which one you you use yeah, I mean, I use Python. I've, so I've written my own software in Python that, that does all my, my, my automated trading. Um, for my non-automated trading, I'm literally just using a spreadsheet. I could put that in Python as well, but the, the, you know, the, it's a lot of work for no return because a spreadsheet does just as well. The the broker I use, I don't mind saying, because I've said it plenty of times before, it's called Interactive Brokers. They, they're not the best broker in the world. They're not the worst broker in the world. The, the, there, are, there are a few reasons why I use them. Uh, for my automated trading, at least. Uh, one is that they offer um, uh, an API, which is a way of connecting uh, with with them so you can do the trading with, with the code you've written yourself. So that's absolutely essential for me. Uh, the second thing is they have quite a wide range of markets that you can trade uh, all across the world. Um, so, you know, the, there's, there's probably hundreds of futures markets I could trade with them if I wanted to. Um, and the, the third reason is is their, their costs. They're, they're pretty cheap you know they're charging quite a low rate of commissions uh, which obviously is, is a good thing um, i use other brokers as well for different parts of my portfolio so um i you know i use about four or five brokers in all some because some are better for different kinds of, of uh, some are better for stocks some are better for a particular kind of tax sheltered account we have in the uk called uh, isa or pension so yeah it's it's uh i wouldn't say that 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 you know they're the best broker they're, they're they're pretty good and there's there's various reasons why it makes sense for me to use them at least i've got a question from my listener about high frequency trading um so you said that uh data first approach may be applicable here in high frequency trading because we have lots of data but do you think that high frequency trading will be or maybe it's already more difficult due to some regulations and 
Another question, is there a future for such trading approach? I mean, should an average investor be afraid of high-frequency trading? I mean, the, the thing about high-frequency trading is it is a legitimate thing to do. I think a lot of people uh, think that it, it's all bad. But, but if you essentially, these people are offering the same service that uh, traditional market makers used to offer, which is that if you're going to, to do some trading uh, and you want to sell, uh, and there's no one there that wants to buy at exactly the same time as you, then they sort of step in and, and hold that risk for a, a short period of time. And, and you know, with high frequency trading, that time period could be very small indeed. Um, and that that's that is a, a worthwhile thing to do. And it's it's a negative skew strategy, uh, as we mentioned before. Um, so you they, they will make lots of small profits and probably occasional big losses. The question becomes, firstly how much that service cost so you know how much money are frequency traders sort of taking out of the market for for the service that they're providing Uh, and the second thing is are there elements of what high frequency traders um are doing or were doing that that you know you can say actually that that is it's not necessary to do that uh, and that looks you know like kind of quote unquote cheating so Things like kind of front running across exchanges um, or using you know, like very strange kinds of orders that exchanges design deliberately to favor high frequency traders. You know, that, that starts to feel a little bit like, mm, I know, I'm, is, is this really the right thing to do? I, I mean, essentially, I, if, if high frequency traders stop making money, then there would be nobody in, in the market making the market. So it would cost more to trade. Spreads would increase. If high frequency traders are making too much money, then um, you know spreads would be narrow. But actually, overall, there would be a reduction in in the returns that you you could you could, the rest of the market was making. What the right level for that is 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 a, is a difficult one, and partly kind of kind of normal economic competition to a degree helps here in the sense that if high frequency trading gets too profitable, you'll get a lot of people going into it uh, and bringing the, re- the returns down. When that doesn't happen, then then yeah, regulation may be necessary. So, I mean, I think I, I think some kind of version of high frequency trading will always be with us because ultimately there has to be somebody in the market willing to buy when you want to sell and no one else is around. Uh, I think the, the, the key issues are, you know, how, how big a part of the market should that be? You know, how profitable should it be? It, but, you know, and how, how much it should be regulated? But it, I don't think it's ever going to go away. I've got some final questions. If someone would like to start investing his, her money, what would you suggest to such person? I mean, because most Probably uh, people are starting with discretionary approach, trading or investing. Do you think it's wrong or maybe it's not that wrong and it's good to make the whole path? I mean, it partly depends on why they're, they're doing it. So if they if they want to just have money invested so that in 20, 30 years time, you know, they can open up their account statement and hopefully have enough to retire on, then I would advise just doing something very boring, which is just investing in a doing what Warren Buffett said. Go and buy a bunch of low-cost index trackers, reasonably diversified portfolio, um, and you could you could even then just not do any trading and just sit on them, and and you'll probably do pretty well. If they're in, if they want to learn about trading and investing, then uh, I would suggest um, maybe doing that, but then also having some money which they they then use to say, okay, I'm going to buy a stock. I'm going to you know watch you know watch that stock move around, and um, you know. If, if they they're, they're find that's kind of interesting, and then maybe they do want to think about the sort of thing I talk about in in, in leverage trading, which is you know we're actually saying right, I'm going to use a system to trade, a simple system. Won't tr- it'll trade a few times a year, you know, just try it. Start dipping your toe into the water. It will tell you a if you're if it's something you do find interesting, and b it'll mean that if if you know if you make mistakes that they will it'll limit the the damage you can do to your to your to your trading capital. Um, and you may think, yeah, actually, this isn't for me, and you want to go back down the low-cost index investing route, or you may get into it. In which case, you you know, you, you at least you'll know the basics and be able to avoid doing anything too stupid, like you know, overtrading or being overleveraged. And do you think that quantitative approach to trading and investing is easier or more difficult than, let's say, ten years ago or when you were starting your career back in two thousand two, if I'm correct? It's definitely easier to access because you know you, there are broker APIs as we've discussed. Uh, there are a lot. There's lots of um, you know programs that you can buy or or even use for free that will, will allow you to run trading systems. Um, 
there's there's a lot of open source code you can you can pick up there's a lot more books and and things out there it's it's you know generally speaking it's cheaper to trade of course the downside of that is that that you know like like all of these things if there was any easy money to be made that that's gone it's now you could do fairly simple things 20 years ago and and uh, now those simple things you know a lot of people are doing them you can still make kind of reasonable returns but but it's not going to be you know you're not going to make a lot of money but that's just the, the cycle of the way markets work i mean i, I think if i try try to do what i do now 20 years ago i would really have struggled because it would have been a lot more difficult um so i'd, I'd say from that perspective it's definitely got easier have you read the latest book about jim simons the man who solved the the market i have well, it's a great book and uh, any comments you shouldn't read it uh if you think if i read this book i'll work out how jim simons makes all his money You will, you will learn almost nothing in that respect. It's a great story. And one of the most striking things to me is reading through it. There's about four or five times where Jim Simons actually sort of talks in the, the kind of terms we were discussing earlier. And he's like, oh, goodness, I don't trust this trading system. I think we should override it and do this instead. Or he's talking about his own personal portfolio and he's having a discussion with a broker about whether he should buy or sell. And he's like, oh, I'll just go with my gut. I mean, this is a guy who's, you know, made more money from systematic trading than everyone else, I would say. So uh, I, I found what I found most interesting about that book was the, the, the fact that Jim Simons, you know, has the same flaws as, as I do and as anyone who's trading systematically does, which is, you know, much as you want to trust your system and let it run, you're still going to have these doubts about whether that's the right thing to do. So, um, you know, I found that the most illuminating thing about the book, uh, definitely. But yeah, no, great book and, and definitely worth reading. Just just don't expect to... Uh, to find the holy grail in there because it's not all right any other books you would recommend uh, to read apart from yours of course which i do really recommend and really i'm, I'm very grateful for these books because they show this uh, investment world from a different perspective from the perspective of someone someone who is professional so uh, for someone like me a retail trader that's uh, that's a uh, that's a novelty i mean so many books where, where to start I guess I'll just try and pick out a few at random. So um, in terms of the mechanics of trading and also in terms of, you know, he, he writes, he's, he's got a series of books he's written where he's interviewing traders, books by Jack Schwager. I would recommend those. I've also reckon books by uh, Andreas Klenau. Um So he's written uh, a couple of books on, on trend following, one in futures, one in stocks. So, um, you know, and they're, they're um, a bit easier to read than my books. I think <laughs> you'd say mine are a bit more, a bit, a little bit more uh, academic or technical in nature. His are a bit easier to read. So maybe, maybe more, you, if you're finding my books heavy going, then maybe have a look at his. Uh, and he's also written, written a book recently about um, how to use Python, Python programming language, which is what I use to, um, to build and uh, backtest uh, trading strategies. Uh, and I'm slightly biased because I actually wrote a guest chapter in that book. So, uh, you know, I obviously think that's a good book. Yeah, I mean, one thing, I guess you put the link to my website, and my blog, and that, that there's actually a page on there where I list about 30 or 40 books that I, I've kind of read and, and found uh, interesting because uh, I'm a pretty, I, I read pretty widely and, uh, you know, this it's very hard to, just, to sort of even pick one book and say, yeah, this, this is the book you have to read. Even my books, I'd say, you have to read more than one book to, to learn how to trade or learn how to code. And how about other sources? I don't know, blogs, podcasts, do you have any favorite ones? So for blogs, I mean, what I there's a website called Quantocracy. Right. So it's the word quant full of B, by the word ocracy as, as an aristocracy. And that, that's really good because what they do is they actually have a curated uh, list of links to different blogs. Uh, and that's updated every day whenever any of these people publish. So, again, I'm probably biased because I'm on there as well. But, um, you know, if any any blog that links to from that site is, is normally uh, definitely worth reading, I would say. Uh, and there's a good range of, of articles there from perhaps more technical stuff, like the kind of thing I put on my blog, to just to, to kind of more basic stuff uh, as well. So, um Uh, rather than recommending a, a single blog, I'd say if you go to that site, you'll get links to to a, bun a bunch of other blogs that are really interesting. By the way, And Andreas Kleno was the guy who recommended me to to make an interview with you because he said that you are just just um, wonderful guy to 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 make an interview with. So that's why uh, we are here. Yeah, he's always doing that, which is which is nice, but also a, a shame because uh, then every time I meet him, I, I I'm like I suppose I owe you another beer for that recommendation, and it adds up to a lot of beer. 
<laughs> okay. Um, is there anything else you would like to add? Maybe question I haven't asked you. Is there anything else you would like to 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 say before we will finish this interview? No, I mean just just I think um, generally to say to people that that um, oh, we've kind of touched on a lot of negative things about about trading and investing, but but uh, you know it's absolutely fascinating and interesting world, and uh, you know don't don't be afraid to, to to get into it if you do find it interests you. Just just be aware that, that you know there are a few pitfalls you need to be careful about, and um, hopefully. Uh, I've kind of pointed you in the direction of uh, avoiding some some mistakes, so you you'll, you'll have some money left at the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Rob, for for your time today. You shared with us a lot of great uh, knowledge, so thanks a lot and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. <laughs>